Hey guys, this is Holland Chambers Biology coming to you with a brief lecture on natural selection and the evidence of evolution. So a lot of these topics we're going to talk about today are review from previous lectures or labs that you've already done. Um, however, there are some things that we are going to be talking about that is new. So <clears throat> the first thing that I want to go over is natural selection. So as a review, natural selection is the survival of the fittest. Now remember the fittest is not who's big buff and strong, um, but fittest means that you have the ability to survive and reproduce. Now in order to survive, you're going to need variations, um, you're going to need adaptations, maybe behavioral, structural, or functional um, in order to reproduce. You don't want to just have one child, um, you know, after 50 years and then have another child. You want to have an overproduction of children, which in turn leads to competition, um, which is um, another factor in the survival of the fittest um, kind of modality. Um, in order to evolve into something new, natural selection also states um, that if you have reproductive isolation, that also will help lead to um, a new species or speciation. And of course, cat catastrophes help with that. So here is just a real quick um, flow diagram that takes you through you know, how natural selection can lead to evolution. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, this process of natural selection, which gives us high fitness, um, the ability to survive and reproduce, which in turn can lead to speciation, again, the um, production of a new species, and that is evolution. It's, it's you know, change over time. Now, with evolution, what we're going to be looking at today is the different types of evolution that can actually happen. So whether it's punctuated, convergent, co-evolution, divergent evolution, you know, how do we go about to evolve? Now, how do we know things are actually evolving? Now, take a step back and remember your different evidences for evolution. So we're going to be looking at bones, looking at the fossil record. We're going to look at carbon dating. We're going to look at biogeo graphical, um, you know, where are they found? We're going to look at anatomy. So whether it's homologous structures, analogous structures, vestigial structures, and of course, comparative anat um, embryology, which is the study of embryos. And again, all of these combined together. We don't just look at one or another, but we want to look at all of this as a whole to determine if something has evolved from another ancestor or is a completely, you know, oddity. Um, and so what we want to look at first is um, punctuated equilibrium, okay? So punctuated equilibrium is did this species just, you know, suddenly appear, you know, into the Earth's record um, due to catastrophe or was there some type of fast evolution that was happening or did this species actually evolve over a slow, gradual change, um, which is known as gradualism? So 90% of our species is going to be going through gradualism. And then, of course, the rare case um, will actually have punctuated or fast um, equilibrium, which allows evolution to happen, um, you know, very rapidly. Now, let's go and talk about the different types of evolution. So convergent. I want you guys to remember this as you are converging onto the freeway. So I'm in a Range Rover, you're in a Range Rover, we're all the same um, color uh, car, same wheels, same you know year, same leather, same everything. So if my Range Rover is exactly like your Range Rover, does this mean that we're related? Absolutely not. Um, and this is what convergent evolution is. It means that two separate species that have no relationship whatsoever actually evolve the same traits. Now, whether it is um, the ability to fly, say like the sugar glider, which is a possum, compared to the flying squirrel, completely unrelated to each other over here, but yet they have the same traits. They co-convergently evolved those same traits due to environmental pressure. Um, you know, echolocation but between, say, bats and whales. Um, they evolve the same type of function, but again, a bat is not necessarily related to a whale, okay? Um, 
Here's another example of convergent evolution. You can kind of see um, the sugar glider is from Australia. Um, the flying squirrel over here is from North America. Um, again, they look very similar. They act very similar. They're both flying. I mean, they pretty much look identical to, you know, they both look like squirrels, but genetically, they are not related. Okay, so convergent, you evolve the same traits, but you're unrelated. Now you also have a second type, which is co-evolution. Now co-CEO of a company means that we both have the power. So I'm not the boss, you're not the boss, we're both the boss. So that's kind of how co-evolution works. It means that we have two organisms that are actually responding with each other. So if I grow bigger, you grow bigger. If I grow spikes, you end up growing bigger claws so you can, you know, kind of counteract my spikes. Um, a lot of this happens with um, po um, pollination. So if the flower starts to change, the pollinator must change as well because they actually both benefit from each other. The pollinators are getting, say, food or nectar, and then the flower in turn is getting that um, pollination of um, spreading its seeds or pollen to continue to grow. We also have divergent evolution. Um, so divergent evolution means that we are going to evolve from a common ancestor. So whether it's like one to two or maybe one to, you know, three or four, it's we can see that progressive um, chain. Now, we watched in class about the evolution of the chicken, right? And they realized that the chicken is a direct descendant of the giant T-Rex. I mean, giant T-Rex is a chicken. It had the bird, you know, bones, it's hollow, it had, you know, the um, the collar, the wishbone, it's got the same, you know, feet with a little kind of, you know, thumb on the side. I mean, everything was very, very similar. So again, that's what's known as divergent evolution is lineage from a common ancestor. Now, when we look at these populations, we also want to see, okay, how did that happen? How did we get two different species or how did we suddenly evolve together from one species that's now extinct and now we have a completely new species. Um, so there's three graphs that I'm gonna walk you guys through and these are the graphs that you're gonna use for your homework assignment, which is known as a selective pressure graph worksheet. Okay, so make sure to come back to this lecture and look at this. Um, first one is directional selection. Just like it sounds, it's the direction, okay? So we're gonna go in a direction, either to the right or to the left, okay? So what we're looking at is if our normal variations, let's say we're light green, when the environment changes, let's say it suddenly snows, all those animals that are white like the snow are going to blend in with their environment and survive from predation. Whereas all those animals that are say really, really bright green, um, we're gonna see them in the white snow. And so predators are gonna be able to pick them off. So suddenly our allele frequency, it always goes back to genetics. The allele frequency of the population shifts and now we start actually mating with other organisms that are all white. So then that way our babies stay white to match the snow. And then that in turn allows for our population to continue. Okay, so directional selection means that we're gonna shift from right to left. Now stabilizing selection is the opposite. What happens here is stabilizing selection, we're actually going to squeeze the graph in, which means that both sides decline. Okay, so instead of being extreme white and extreme dark green, we're now all yellow, okay? So only the yellow are gonna survive. And so this is a classic example of natural selection where um, only one specific type of color is surviving in that specific environment. So whether it's a green leaf and a green plant, or sorry, a green leaf and say a green um, ant, or um, it's, you know, turning into um, a grass bed where everything is green and therefore organisms that match that grass are going to survive, whereas something that would match snow is going to get picked out. Okay, so stabilizing means that we, the extremes on both sides decrease and only the middle or the moderate are going to survive. So what we call that is the intermediate. 
Now the third type of graph is disruptive. Disruptive means that we actually, um, the norm is no longer advantageous. Okay, so the norm is no longer advantageous. What becomes advantageous is our two extremes. So in this particular case, we have an environment that shifted, um, mainly competition is usually what happens um, in this particular situation where one species um, used to be, well, they used to be a whole species together, let's say killer whales, okay? And then the killer whales, because they started to um, lose resources, one population decided to go eat sharks only, and then another population decided to go eat salmon only. And all of a sudden, you get this diversifying of diet they're no longer breeding together because they're off in two different areas. One's in New Zealand and one's in, say, you know, Washington. And because they're no longer mating, they're eating differently. Suddenly their language changes. And again, over 150,000 years, um, this is actually proven in science, these two types of killer whales evolved into two different species from an original ancestor. Okay, so disruptive means that the original norm has declined for whatever reason, and we end up getting two new species. So here is all three of our um, selected pressures um, from evolution, just to kind of see as a whole. You've got directional, again, it's gonna shift from right to left. Stabilizing, it squeezes in, and we only have the intermediate that's favored. And then disruptive means that the two extremes are now favored. Now, if you are not shifting with this graph, you might actually end up um, not surviving at all. And that's gonna lead us to extinction. So extinction is obviously um, the death of a species, as in that species is no longer on the planet. Most mass ex extinctions are due to some type of catastrophe like an asteroid. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that we've actually had five major extinctions um, throughout our world's history, as far as we know. Um, and so extinction is not a new thing. Um, if you guys look over here, some of the biggest disasters in history, I mean, the Permian um, age is 95% of our organisms went extinct. And then, you know, during the KT, um, you know, uh, which was when the dinosaurs died, 80% um, of our um, organisms went extinct. So again, even though you have mass extinctions, life will find a way. And so the mammals that hid underground during this explosion um, were able to actually survive, and therefore we had a massive explosion of new traits, new DNA. And so um, I wanna just kinda end this with um, Jurassic Park, this is always a classic evolution. Um, Michael Crichton wrote in his first book, because the history of evolution is that life escapes all barriers, life breaks free, life expands to new territories, painfully, perhaps even dangerously, but life finds a way. And so whether, you know, especially in Jurassic Park, these organisms that were female were not supposed to mate together and have children, but Parthenogenesis means that um, your own eggs as one female, I can have two eggs come together and give birth to a female organism of myself. And that's pretty much a clone. And so animals do this naturally. Um, snakes do this a lot in nature. Um, if they can't find a mate for years, that female snakes, the two eggs will come together and she will give birth to a whole bunch of female snakes that are identical clones to themselves. And so life will find a way. Um, and if for any reason it doesn't, then um, that life goes extinct. And so we'll be talking about extinction a little bit more um, throughout this unit, but otherwise, hopefully you guys understand um, how evolution works, um, you know, how we start to change and um, progress and let me know if you guys have any questions. So this is Holland Chambers Biology, check it out.